The Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring. Hello, welcome to the best of 2005 in the American Le Mans series. On the worldwide stage, and a fast start to the international of course, this ALMS series was born in 1999, so this is the sixth season of it. As in Le Mans, there are four classes, the LMP1s, the LMP2s, the GT1s, and the GT2s. As always, the big favourites, well, for the overall wins, are going to be the two Audis from the champion team in the top category. But it seems that the two Lola AERs from the Dyson team could pose a threat this season. The arena is empty, except for one man still driving and striving as fast as he can. The sun has gone down and the moon has come up. There are going to be ten races in 2005. Most of them are two hours and 45 minutes, except to bring, which is round one, which will be 12 hours, the Petit Le Mans round nine, which is 10 hours, and the Laguna Seca Le round 10, which will be four cool hours. Cars, world class drivers, premier road courses, born in France in 1923 with the first running of the 24 hours of Le Mans. The so in the GT1s, there'll always be a battle between the two works Corvettes, and in GT2, as always, a big battle to come between the Porsches. Drivers from around the world strut their speed, skill, and endurance. It's going to be Four a thrilling series once again. On We're in Sebring for the opening the round of the season. This one in Florida, the prestigious 12 hours. This is the American Le Mans series. It was, no doubt, the potential for exactly this type of day that helped inspire Alec Ullman to create an international so sports car race. it's here time now Florida to go and see the big moments ago. of the race skies, with our original live commentators trackside at Sabrina. truly makes for the perfect March day. Speed Channel's coverage of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring is brought to you by new high endurance oils from Mobile. The oil that's changing oil. By Porsche. Porsche, there is no substitute. And by Michelin, a better way forward. Back at Sebring, everybody, as we close in on the start of this great America Le Mans season, the 53rd annual Mobile One. 12 hours of Sebring, and this is the Pirelli flyover. It came courtesy of the 93rd Fighter Squadron based at Homestead Air Force Base just south of Miami. It was an absolutely glorious moment as these great jets came across this phenomenal raceway. And now let's go down for motorsports most famous command. Drivers, start your engines. You're allowed to Our Grand Marshal, Bobby Rahal, issuing those famous words. Let's get down now to another member of our pit commentary team, Andrew Marriott, for more on our other classes. Yeah, the Pirelli storylines in GT2. Sasha Masson alongside me here, going for an incredible straight five wins in a row. But someone could stop him. It could be American muscle power of the pain Aussies. The 50 car actually qualified second. Well, Sasha's with me. Sasha, this is going to be hard, hard work for you. And you've got a second co-driver. Are you getting old? Because normally you do this with just uh, Lucas Lure. Well, uh, some rumors say I'm getting old, but I think I'm just getting more intelligent. Uh, because the last years they were so incredibly hard when you just have with two drivers. So this time uh, we have three. And uh, also it's very good if you have two pilots, uh, co-pilots that are really good. So there's no risk. Are you worried at all about the panels? Uh, for uh, I don't know for how long they will be so quick, but I hope it will not be for 12 hours. Thanks, Sasha. Well, for the P2 story, let's go to Lindsay Zariak. What's that?
guys, typically if a P2 wins this race, it is not necessarily because of speed, but more because their team was the team left standing. This year, the depth in this field is amazing, and this is something to watch out for. The Kumo tires, Miracle Motorsports has decided to make this switch. They have not had a lot of time to test. So the question is, could they get burned by this new addition, or could this be the edge that gets them a win here at Sebring? Now to another member of our team, Ralph Shaheen. Thanks, Lindsay. I'm joined now by a couple of gentlemen who have seen a lot of laughs around this famed racetrack. Dorsey Schrader won here, driving in a Mercury Cougar, and Alan Decadene has seen it from the cockpit of a Porsche and a Ferrari, just to name a couple. Well, there's quite a few ways you can get to victory lane here at Sebring, and being fast is just part of it. Let's break down our Porsche keys of victory now, beginning with the prototype category and the P1 class, Dorsey. Passing savvy. These P1 cars are extremely fast, but they're racing with three sets of classes of cars that are slower. You can't just go knocking defenders off, making extra pit stops if you're going to win. Secondly, can the Dyson cars last? Rob Dyson has two very good cars, good drivers, but this track has been their nemesis. If they should be able to not break down, they might. And the P2 category, lighter cars, super drivable, super maneuverable. If they keep snapping at the heels of the P1 cars, slightest error up the sharp end, we can see a big surprise in the P2. The next two divisions fall under the banner of the production cars, and GT1 this past winter, Dorsey, has everybody talking with a lot of excitement. A lot of new cars, Aston Martin, Corvette, Vet, Celine, but with new cars last. And GT2, you can't crash these cars over the curbs the way they do in other races. You've got to be nice and smooth, nice and straightforward. Another thing, too, is if the yellow flags come out, we get a caution lap here. You could make up a whole lap or lose a whole lap. So the drivers have to know where they are on the track, too. Greg, spectacular race cars, incredible driving talent, and one very tough and challenging racetrack should make for an amazing 12 hours of Sebring today. Ralph, that is exactly what everybody is, in fact, anticipating. We want to take you now to the entirety of our Aqua Velva starting grid. You've met the Mobile One pole sitters, but there are some great stories. Qualified third overall in P1, the first of the Dyson cars. Guy Smith turned the fastest lap in practice by over half a second over anybody else. John Field is very, very quick, and his car, the pole sitter in P1, 10 seconds faster than last year's qualifying record, knocking on the door of P1 times. In GT1, of course, the two Corvettes looking very, very strong, but it wasn't the Aston Martins or the Maserati that qualified third. It was the Asemco Celine on Michelin tires this year, a rejuvenated program. And also, in the GT2 category, the biggest class here in terms of number, without doubt, everybody figured it would be Porsches. Just loaded up at the top of the field. Andrew Marriott alluded to it. Bill Oberlin took the number 50 Panos EGTLM to second on the starting grid. And I think Sasha Mawson was indicating they're a little worried about that car's speed. Reliability may be another story, but there are definitely a number of good things to watch here. One of them, when we get to the back end of the grid, you'll notice in the 35th spot, the P2 car of last year's champion team, Clint Field. Problems in the practices. They didn't get a really good time turn. We would expect them to be coming up through the pack, but as we've talked about and talked about, you've got to do that with some savvy here and not start knocking things off of your race car and slowing your progress up through the field. Now, one of the things that we've talked about a lot, Dorsey Schrader, is the challenges of this circuit. It's time for the Yokohama Track Mac. Give us some specifics. Well, this is the toughest of most racetracks, and you're going to have a lot of congestion. You're going to see it on, between turn one and three right there, five and seven, down into the hairpin, a lot of passing right there. Thirteen, you look at tower turn from there to this fastest bishop bend, fastest corner on the course. Cars going side by side can have a lot of trouble there. And this turn 17, the nemesis coming on the hit straight away. And bumps is the other yeah, issue. Bumps, Keep yeah. an eye on here. That's huge. And where they are working right now, coming out of that uh, 16th turn and making their way down into the turn, the final turn called Sunset Bend, right as you get underneath that bridge, it, incredibly bumpy. And the same thing going into turn one, Alan. And that's a blind approach, both of these corners time to practice of course but this is the lap the hearts will be beating a lot faster now well fairly fast let's say and this is it this is the off the whole 12 hours of Sebring and we've worked here all week and we cannot wait to see what's going to happen let's get down to Calvin Fish apparently problems for one of our contenders 
We've actually got two cars down here in pit lane. They failed to make the mark in terms of the time frame and allowed to get on the grid. One is the number 15, Benny Motorsports LMP2 car. One of the strikers, Marino Franchitti, had a problem with that car during the warm-up. They had to do some work to the hub. The 47 car will start pit lane also, Greg. Thanks, Cal. And the field coming underneath the bridge, onto the front straight. Pace car is in. The two ADT champion Audis coming up to speed. And we are underway at Sebring. The American Le Mans season has begun. Dyson car looks to the inside side wisely tucks back in and it is the two champion cars that lead at the exit of turn one and now they head up into the s's and it is as well oh, a lot of brake lock up there from the number 20 car in the hands of guy smith well that's cold tired brake lock up and i wanted to see these dyson cars really pounce at the start they need to Well, that was the sound of the 20 car, the Dyson car, saying he has a puncture. Guy Smith, and you see the smoke right there, he definitely has a puncture. Left front, locked up and down. And we also saw spun sideways in the track, the number 45 Flying Lizard Motorsports Porsche, started by John Fogarty, the reigning Toyota Atlantic champion. So problems for some of these cars right at the off, and certainly this is huge news. Yeah, seriously bad luck for them. He obviously picked up a I sharp piece of lint or something, got here, himself a puncture on the first lap, but that's what this endurance racing is all about. He's got to creep that car back to the pits now, get that wheel off, get a new one on, and get back out there. And probably he'll gas it to catch up, because you've got to keep up if you're going to be in the, uh, you know, the, the hunt for the win here. You heard the crew man saying, take it easy, don't tear up the floor panel. He's talking about the tire, the left front being down is in danger of delaminating and coming apart. If it does that, it will beat the well, under tray. Start. Smith already in trouble in the 20 car with a puncher. Well done. There you hear the uh, Piro getting the information that the 20 is in trouble already. And like I said, if that tire comes apart and it damages the under tray, well, that's a very big fix indeed. Got a good glimpse there of uh, James Weaver and the team, Tedford Norcold, Dyson Lola, as he sits in the third spot. But up front, Emanuele Piro was starting to ease away just a little bit already from J.J. Leto in the second car. Weaver close at hand, and that promotes the P2 class leader of John Field is already up into the uh, fourth spot. But Calvin Fish, the uh, Emanuele Piro, is wasting little time opening up a bit of a margin. He's certainly on the gas hard. In fact, the team are running brand new Michelin tires here. They only tested them for the first time yesterday morning with all of the rain that we had here on Thursday from the two car. They got a lucky break in the morning warm-up. They had a starter motor go bad. So certainly if that happened during this 12-hour event would have cost them a lot of time on two roads. If they changed that over, it's only happened twice before they said in all four years of running the RA, but they got it fixed and he should be fine. Watching some of the telemetry, it really gives you an idea of some of the loads that these cars and therefore the drivers are dealing with. But let's go back and take a look at what happened to the Flying Lizard number 45 Porsche. This is in turn one, as you see the exit of turn one. This is the straight now headed down. Oh, got caught off right there. Locked up the brakes before he spins. That'll have flat spots. And the number 20, Guy Smith, has made it down into pit lane. Craig, he's brought it to a stop. Damage, obviously, on the left front tire. That's what we saw before, but no damage on the bodywork. It looks like he managed to save that. It was a puncture. No contact with any other car. They will put four tires on it as Guy Smith sits in the car waiting. If they can get this car back out, he's going to have to drive it very hard to get back to the front. I did talk to Chris Dyson earlier, and he said, we're not concerned about only two drivers. The pace will run. It'll be fine. We should be okay. But the pace they're going to have to run now just got turned up a notch, Greg. Well, Guy Smith is the new shoe in the Dyson program, but as we talked about, in practice, that lap he turned was just blindingly quick, and if you've got to have somebody hustle in the car, he's the guy to do it. The problem is, is they have now gone down another lap. Well, I'll tell you, Chris Dyson says it's no problem with two drivers. Uh, it is, too. I've done it here with two drivers. It's very hard. You heard Sasha Mossen say, and he's a young man, and they call him a young man, but he's a young man still, and he says, you know, I've learned I might be a little smarter. It takes three. Well, you're right. Look at all the grip they're getting out of these cars these days. We've already had a look at the telemetry there. I mean, these guys are pulling over two Gs loading as they go into the uh, tighter turns. Well, that's a, that's a big loading to have on your body for whatever, six hours if there's just two of you. Six hours each makes 12. Now, look at that. Hero using the curbs for the little S's there. Something that uh, I wouldn't think you'd want to see. He's making an adjustment right there. 
Working through the Fangio chicane up to the legendary Cunningham corner. We are very early in the going here at the 53rd Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. Welcome back to Sebring International Raceway. We are 12 minutes, make it 11, left in this race. And you can see Tom Christensen is doing everything he can to maintain the margin he has, a little over 11 seconds. And let's throw some numbers at you. As we said, about 11 minutes to go. They're lapping at a minute 50 or thereabouts. So say five laps left, plus maybe one uh, on the white flag. So boy, McNish is taking it down to 10 seconds, but he needs to crack off two to two and a half seconds lap to make this uh, miracle happen yeah because they're actually lapping now and look low 150s i mean 48 upper 48 there's only about another second to go at the very best this track was and i imagine it isn't at its best because it's got a lot of grit and, 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 and derision on there plus that oil of course all mixed in and the telling tale of the tape will be uh, traffic calvin down here with dr ulrich head of audi sport and uh, what a terrific race we've seen here tonight with the two champion cars yeah, it's a really terrific race. Uh, we are now close to the end, and the cars are separated a little bit more than 10 seconds. I think that's the best way to show how great sports car racing can be. Yeah. It certainly shows once again how great this R8 sports car is, winning since the year 2000, and I think it's now won like 53 events worldwide or something. But the big news is, what's on the drawing board for next year? What are we going to see from Audi, do you believe? Yeah, we are going to follow what we committed. We are going to come with a new prototype next year, and I'm looking forward to some more good races in the future. So after seeing this car perform, do you believe you can build something a little bit better, I assume? Yeah, I think uh, our target is about that we will, at the end of the year, start to run this car to develop it on the racetracks and on testing tracks. And I think it could be a good idea to come back to Sebring with the car and do the very first one here. We did it with the R8 and it was uh, a good start for an excellent, uh, uh, let's say, career. And maybe we could do it the same way. The car has been unbelievable, but also the engine. And there's a lot of rumors floating around about what you may put in the back of that car. What can you tell us about the power plant? For sure we will have an engine again that is something a little bit special as we did it in history because whenever we try to come with a new car we also want to bring some steps in technology like we do it with our road cars. Okay, well there you hear the word, they're coming back which is great news and uh, we're talking about diesels possibly boys. It's coming yeah. back with an engine, we know that much. Well that's from the good doc himself, I mean it's nice we actually now uh, do know for sure that there's something tasty coming along. Eight and a half minutes remaining. The margin is nine and a half seconds. It's about four laps timed at a minute 50 per lap. And uh, one of the things that we can at least talk about here is remember, the official closest finish ever was a managed finish for the Audi team early, early on in the Audi R8 career. It was down to a second, and it was a photo finish. In 1999, the margin was a little over nine seconds for what they're saying is the true closest finish. So we may at least see that, even uh, if yeah, Big Fish can't get there. This isn't managed. That. This isn't managed. No, no, this is not managed, but you're going to see that because this next lap, it should be under nine and a half seconds unless there's traffic. Like I said, the key here can be traffic. Both these cars giving it their all and they're all going to come into slower cars that are also going to be all. And it's great uh, stuff, isn't it? Though? It really is. Two, two Grand Prix men really gassing it in the best sports car that we've ever seen on the track, one yeah. way or the other, yeah. And, you know, right now, nine and a half seconds separates them after 11 hours and, you know, 40-plus minutes. Right. So it's pretty amazing stuff. Now, you just saw in our speed strip, we showed you the intervals and the other three classes, and they're all multiple laps. So you're not missing anything. It's just this P1 and overall battle right now is very compelling between the two team cars. It's very decent of Porsche to give us this lovely aerial cam view as well. I mean, this is one of the best ways you can ever watch sports car racing. Whereupon we've lost it, but uh, guys are dicing. The number two of Mick Nish, and uh, that last lap, he ran only two tenths quicker than Christensen, but so he, it went from 9.5 to 9.3 doors. But he, he, as we saw from the Porsche aerial cam there, he had to pass three right. different cars to get that. Now that that has been said and done, this next lap should be pretty quick. Seven minutes remaining. I would think this is quite a battle to witness as another driver in another car. These guys can oh, ride. Oh boy. You know, what a great what a great ringside scene. I would want my spotter, my crew guy, to let me know that these two hound dogs are at my back door because boy, they I mean they are out. Yeah, they got teeth too. 
Now, obviously, Christensen knows McNish is coming, but he also knows he's got 10 seconds with, uh, what now, three laps to go. Uh, yeah. He can be a little patient in traffic and not do anything silly. He's not going to back off a lot. Probably he does have that bit of a mark. Well, that's Ooh. Oh, there was a block. Plus, of course, if McNish were to catch him, uh, kind of, still got to get by. I mean, that right, yeah, is right. the, uh, as we all know, catch, uh, catching someone up is one thing, getting by is another. And for these two cars, equally matched, getting by would not be easy at night, and as we said earlier, once you get offline, Plus you don't know what you're going to need. Three laps to go. Keep it up. So no gain on that lap either. one radio that we listened to right there. Good instructions. They both ran 50, 50 second, one minute 50.3 for Christensen, 150.1 for McNish. Good two instructions. Two. Yeah, very good instructions. Keep, keep it up, Tom. Oh, eight and a half seconds now. You heard the 51.3 for Tom. McNish just went a one minute 50.5, so he took another second off. You could just get an eyeball on him, right, Alan? If you could mm. see him. Boy, it'd make a difference. I say that, I, I do not think there can be another naps of a second in this thing, really. I mean, I they're, they're really circulating about just as darn quick as anyone can. I agree with you there. I think that's, that's all you're seeing there. That's why they are so close, yeah. because they're identical cars, aren't they? Yeah. It's, it's a treat, good. actually. This is a real treat for everybody watching this show to see these two GP boys really hacking it, and I think it's fantastic. And speaks, speaks, speaks volumes for the cars, speaks volumes for the drivers, five, speaks five, volumes for the team. Five. Well, right now, it's under the closest finish ever in the history, yeah. if it's, it, and I'm sure it's going to get tighter yet. And five minutes remaining. Now, we're going to try with our uh, Porsche aerial cam here, once we get down to the long on the back straight, and if we can pull that view back a little bit and show you what the margin is here as we head into the last few laps. So, let's see what we can do. Just can't like to ask our producer perhaps to make kindly not go to break just yet. <laughs> <laughs> for at least four they minutes. already we already have settled that issue before the last break. We were told and we told everybody we're here right to the finish. 8.5 is a report on the split. There's the leader on your right. Pull back, pull back, pull back. Where is the two car? Here is the leader. There, it there is. he is right there. Here is probably your second place car. Yeah. It's actually this car right here. Oh, God. He's going to catch him. He's going to see him. They're on the Amazing. same spot Amazing. straight away now. All right. You heard that. Christensen, they just told him he turned to 50.8. And a 50.5. Uh, oh, there he goes. There goes McNish. One point one for McNish oh, on the current traffic. lap. So, yeah, he just lost four tenths. As we are now under four minutes to go here. likely was you saw McNish uh, get bopped just a little bit when he came up behind the Viper who got caught behind another car and he had to do that big bob and weave and that very likely could have cost him that uh, about eight tenths of a second in that one run alone. Three minutes. Not much you can do about it now with an eight second deficit. Both these guys know where they stand. Yeah. Actually, Christensen's he's responded good old Tom. Look, he's he's it a bit. He responded. There's your race leader, Christensen. Boy, I tell you what, I mean, he has done everything he possibly can do. When it's clear track, he's matching McNish for times. And yeah. I mean, that's the telling factor. Traffic is traffic. But yeah. when he's got the clear track, he's doing everything. Well, that's being a professional, isn't it? That's yeah. what they pay these guys for. I'm glad they pay him, too. They've another really, really <laughs> good show for everybody else. Closest in the history. If it, if it stays where it is. And I really don't want to mention the downside of things, but two penalty stops by the number two car. Well, yeah, that's you know, true. I, it's, it could, I mean, that really could be the telling factor. 8.9, Tom. Stays the same. Yeah. Stays the same, so it's just under the closest finishing history. JJ may have made a point earlier that it could be Alan's uh, tires are just starting to, you know, go the wrong way. I mean, uh, the man's going to charge as hard as he can. You know, Mickness... There you see the countdown clock, minute 46. Mickness would just slow up a little bit, they wouldn't have to do two laps. All right, two laps. another one left. Well, there you have it. Uh, obviously, Christensen got by, and he got by just before they figured that 
he'd be able to run one lap to the check or so they have to do one more and uh, it's down to 7.6 7.6 white flag this time by white flag this time by white flag that means last lap yes yeah and he needs to get four seconds a lap Yep, that's what he would need to and get. A yep. pass. And a pass. And make the pass. Yeah. No, with any way, this is going to, uh, we're going to have a change in the result here. Is there something else gets in the way? Stranger things have happened. Yeah. Well, it's been worth waiting 12 hours, guys, hasn't it? This is it certainly has. Yeah. While we watch this race, it's a great race going on. Also, we should say that Aston Martin is also in the shape of tickets first yeah. ever win. Yeah, that's right. In GT1. That's right. Yep. And you're a Burtmeister in the 31 Porsche has just been on top of the game all day, even yep. though the shock absorber has been a pain and a nuisance. Mm -hmm. They've been unbeatable and still remain so. And, and great effort by Corvette, too. Uh, like second in the GT1 to the Aston Martin, but considering all the work they have to do and all the matchups and stuff. Very good. And like you said earlier, the Dyson boys will come in third, which is probably where they yeah. were going to come in. White flag this time, Tom. 7.6. Yeah, I think they can all be very proud of themselves, actually. One way or the other, this has been an exemplary race, I think, for, for a lot of teams. Here's your pit straight. Now look up on the left there, you're going to see the white flag. One to go. His lap that time, a 152.6. Look here. Same straightaway. There is McNish getting the white flag right there at start finish line. Let's see what McNish's time is this time by. Uh, 152.5, so a difference of a 10. So there you have it. I mean, McNish is immensely talented, incredibly gifted, but right now he needs to be a Las Vegas magician to be able to make that car yeah. just disappear. It's really where we are. Well, they got about three and a half miles to duke it out, and that's going to be all. Yeah. I think we're looking at the justified oh, okay. result. We do have a lap car that's going to be... No wall rushing, boys. No wall rushing. Results in each class in terms of winners, and we'll be right back. <laughs> 